Welcome to Warrior Stories. My name is Susanna Clark Taylor. Today is December 29th, 2022, and my guest today is Alex Burns from Virginia. Hi, Alex. Hi, Susanna. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. So I always like to say how I know my guests. And Alex, you and I know one another because both of us are 2022 graduates of the Virginia Partners in Policymaking Advocacy Training Program put on by the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities. And I have to say that was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. And one of the most meaningful parts of that experience was getting to know all of the other advocates that were participating. And you were one of those advocates. And I've just really enjoyed getting to know you this last year. Thank you, Susanna. I myself am a person with disabilities. Right. Autism, uh, of course, like a lot of autistic people, I do like talking about things that interest me and am very much passionate about. But I do know that can sometimes get a bit repetitive for people. And I feel like because of my autism, I have struggled with trying to ask other people about things they're into and things about themselves. Because so that is sort of conversational type of struggle I've had challenges with before, but I've gotten better at it. I've gotten better at it. And then Tourette syndrome is, uh, of course, this uh, disability where like I'm thinking of a certain thought or memory in my brain and that can sometimes distract me from what's going on currently and or what's going on around around me and I am trying my best and for the most part I've overcome sort of that challenge when it comes to sort of paying attention to again what I'm doing or what's around me. That is a struggle I've had but again thankfully I've gotten better at it for the most part. And that's something I should have clarified earlier that as part of Partners in Policy Making there were different kinds of advocates. Some are parents of children with disabilities, and that's the category that I fall into. And of course, there were also advocates in the training program that are adults with disabilities, and that's the category that you fall into. I really appreciated during that year when we were training with partners in policymaking, the perspective that I gained from adults with disabilities, because it helped me to understand my daughter better and some of the, not only the challenges that she'll face as she gets older, but also just the lived experience, you know, because that wasn't my experience. So I'm just so grateful for advocates like you, Alex, that add so much to the world and have taught me so much, help me to gain perspective that I didn't have before, and also help me to understand my daughter more completely. So I'm just so grateful for you and advocates like you and everything that, that I know that I have to learn from you. So thank you, Susanna. Absolutely. I have learned that even before Partners in Policymaking, you were already a very experienced advocate and that you had engaged in a lot of public speech speaking um, throughout the community, um, championing many causes that pertain to the disability space. So as we were preparing for this conversation today, I asked you if you would send me some of your speeches. And I just have to say that I loved reading through them. You are not only a skilled public speaker, but you're also a skilled writer and a very insightful writer. And there was something that you said in one of your speeches that really got me thinking. And so I wanted to start in this space. You come commented on how it feels when somebody else makes your decisions for you. So I was hoping that you could give some examples of times when other people have made decisions for you because of your disabilities and, and how that felt. Well, I do know that to give some examples regarding this, I, I do know there have been scenarios in my life where I guess, uh, I guess to give and the main example I can think of the fact that, you know, sometimes when I've made mistakes my life here and there, you know, I've noticed that sometimes my uh, father kind of overreacts or gets a little bit frustrated and he wants to fix the mistake for me, which I do find kind of unfortunate because, hey, it's my responsibility. So there's there's that. And so that's a challenge I've had here and there. But, you know, I still love my father. I think he's grown out of that, right. it, that mindset for the most part. I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, because that is the exact example I thought of when I read that line in your speech. I turned inward and thought about myself as a parent. And I thought, boy, how many decisions do I make for my daughter without considering maybe what she wants or what she prefers? And she has a major communication barrier. She's nonverbal. And so we have to find other ways to communicate with her and allow her to communicate with us and 
her school has been amazing at implementing some communication devices that have helped her increase her ability to communicate. But just because somebody's nonverbal does not mean they're non-thinking. And so of course there are things that she prefers and I need to learn how to tap into that. Mm -hmm. But that was a really important lesson to me as I was reading through that, that, that caused me to be very Mm self-reflective that as a parent of a child with disabilities, it's really important to, especially as they grow into adulthood, because, you know, Alex, you're a college student now, and I empathize completely with your dad in that situation, because that's how I am. You know, that's the kind of parent I am, is helping my child and and making those decisions for her. But at a certain point, we really need to make it possible for people to make decisions for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I appreciate that example. But, you know, I think that issue applies to spaces even outside the family. I think oftentimes there are policies put into place by local agencies and even all the way up to say federal laws where certain policies or certain rules are put into place that I I always try to give people credit to those making those policies probably think of themselves as being helpful but sometimes they limit the choices of those who are supposed to be benefiting from those decisions, right? And so we always have to keep that in mind as we are making policies that affect people with disabilities in really any community. But right now we're talking about the disability space. As we make policies for people with disabilities, uh, it's really, really important to listen and to give as much choice as possible to the people who are affected by those policies, right? Because we all want autonomy. We all want to make decisions for our own lives, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Something that I don't don't think I knew last year when we were in our advocacy training program together, I didn't know that you were a Special Olympics athlete. And so I'm really excited. I want to ask you about your experiences with Special Olympics. And I want you to explain what sport you play and, you know, some of the experiences that you've had. But first, I wanted to read a quote. I wanted to quote you to you. Okay, so I'm going to read a quote from one of your speeches. And then I'm going to have you tell us about your experiences with Special Olympics. So this is what you said. For those of us with developmental and intellectual disabilities, Special Olympics changed our lives. I know that it's rather a trite thing to say, but imagine for just a moment that it's true, that an organization single-handedly changed the state of play for an entire population of individuals who had never experienced the sweet taste of winning and the bruising lessons of defeat. But sport as the great equalizer is not the sole mission of Special Olympics, not how I see it. Sports are just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. The great story, the human story, lies in the layers of inclusion that this organization has grown around. And I just love that phrase, the layers of inclusion, because goodness, if we applied that to our entire world, right, how many problems would be solved? I just thought that was such beautiful language. So thank you for those words. (laughs) Um, So tell us about your experiences with Special Olympics. What do you play? And, you know, share with us some of your experiences. Well, for starters, I've been involved in Special Olympics since middle school, which for me was back in 2011. So I've been there for many years at this point. The three main sports I've played through this organization are basketball, soccer, and track. Basketball is my favorite, but uh, soccer is second and track is third. I would uh, I would also like to bring up, I uh, Special Olympics has allowed me not only to, of course, stay in shape, exercise, and do some fun sports-based activities, but It allowed me to sort of, you know, connect with other members of the disability community and feel included because I know that's one of Special Olympics goals to have to create a very positive, inclusive environment. I am appreciative of that. Um, It also allowed me to do some of the other um, when I joined it, of course, allowed me to do some other noteworthy activities I've done through Special Olympics as well such as volunteer work on the 4th of July, where I like throw candy to like these groups of people on one side of the highway and and another as we do like this 4th of July parade activity we do every year. I serve as what is known as a Special Olympics Global Messenger, which is a public speaking organization through the Special Olympics program and organization as a whole, where I give speeches on behalf and in support of Special Olympics and the disability community. I have done speeches as a gold master for various uh, different groups of people and different audiences. I've done multiple speeches for the kindergartners, elementary school students at Colonel Ridge Elementary School. 
I've done a couple for Riverside High School. I did one recently for Freedom High School. I did uh, one speech to a group of scientists at HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, numerous uh, golf club areas, and it's been a great experience through Special Olympics. I've also helped out with what is called the Special Olympics plane pull event where I help different where I help like different Special Olympics like athlete teams pull a plane at the Dulles Airport which we do or at least try to do every September of every year and um yeah I would say that Special Olympics has been a great game changer in my life it has helped me both stay in shape and feel included and make some good connections in my community and help my community and all of those wonderful things that bottom line, I am very thankful and blessed for. Awesome. And it sounds like you'll be able to continue to participate for a long time. So this potentially has the ability to continue to be a meaningful part of your life for many years. I love that. What a great organization. Um, okay. So now I wanted to jump into the meat of, of a particular issue that you have been advocating around for quite some time now. And I first learned about this issue last year when we were involved with the Partners in Policymaking Advocacy Training Program from you. I I had very little knowledge about this issue until I heard you give speeches regarding it, and I've been very interested in it ever since. And when I hear about issues, say in the news or whatnot, I immediately think of you and the work that you've been doing around it. So I'm I'm excited to talk about it. So why don't you tell us about the Fair Labor Standards Act? of 1938 and give us some examples of how members of the disability community have been exploited under FLSA all the way back from the 1930s until today that people are still being exploited by by this issue. Sure thing. So FLSA or the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 says in section 14C of said act that it is legally allowed and acceptable to pay any person with disability less than minimum wage. So less, in other words, less than the actual amount a certain company and organization can pay their workers. This was signed into law back in 1938 by former president FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Right. Now, thankfully, uh, I will say this before I get into the exploit examples. Uh, progress has been made because in some form anyway, because with things like, you know, George H.W. Bush's Americans with Disabilities Act, which gave a lot of equal rights to the disability community, as well as former President Barack Obama's uh, WIOA, or Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which gave a lot of benefits and skills and, you know, opportunities to a lot of people who work in the workforce who needed it, which includes the disability community, thankfully. I wanted to take a step back before you gave your examples because I realized I failed to give a little background. So the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 was actually, it was a United States labor law that was created toward the end of the Great Depression with the intent of helping workers, right? It creates the right to a minimum wage and time and a half overtime pay when people work over 40 hours a week. And it also prohibited employment of minors and oppressive child labor. So in theory, the FLSA was a really great thing for society, right? But the problem is, and you just touched on this, that in Section 14C, it directly discriminates the entirety of the disability community right? Indeed it does, yes. Right. So uh, go ahead and explain to us some specific examples of how a Section 14C of FLSA has exploited members of the disability community. Sure. I know right off the bat, I'll start with Henry's Turkey Service, which was a company where certain workers uh, disemboweled turkeys in order to make money. Uh, their take-home pay was $65 a month, and they uh, were forced to like sleep on moldy mattresses, which was brutal for them. And I do know that the owner of Henry's Turkey Service did end up taking a good majority of the money and hard-earned cash that the workers actually earned. And then there was also the even brutal fact that no higher up governments or investigative system or organization really did anything about it or did anything to resolve or prevent this problem from happening. And so unfortunately, that is a brutal scenario that I think will never receive due process. 
you have such important detail here in this speech. I'm going to read a couple things, okay? Mr. Kenneth Henry, owner of Henry's Turkey Service in Adelisa, Texas, exploited hundreds of disabled men over decades with his subminimum wage legal loophole. And Henry's Turkey Service paid disabled workers pennies per hour. To yep, pennies per hour. To disembowel turkeys and their take-home pay was $65 a month, which was drastically lower than what a non-disabled employee would be receiving. And so this particular person specifically sought out grown men with disabilities to do this work because he could legally pay them less. And then he made all of this extra money because he didn't have to pay the employees very much. Yes, because I do know that is indeed what happened. And again, all these organizations I mentioned in the speech as well, and like investigative services, they they didn't do anything about it. So again, the problem was never fully solved if really solved at all well and it says here that the government called it training that these employees were being quote-unquote trained right but they were really just being exploited and that the disabled workers were handcuffed restrained and beaten beaten yes lived in squalor amongst roaches mice and rats and rats on the moldy mattresses that they were forced to sleep on exactly and mr henry used their hard-earned money to renovate his texas ranch his ranch yep He was making a lot of money and they were living in squalor and being exploited, like you said, for decades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was so long ago and there likely will never be justice for those people who were exploited in that situation. And so I, I think it's so important if we can't bring justice to those who went through that experience, at least if we bring a light to their experiences today, then hopefully we can learn from them, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us about Goodwill. Yeah, Goodwill, I know that was an organization that at least at some point in time, again, according to the research, workers there earned as little as 15 cents an hour, whereas the CEOs of that organization earned as much as $712,000 in their annual salary. Right. So that's another example of, you know, an organization that took advantage of the existence of Section 14 of FLSA and yeah. basically exploited it in the worst way possible, just like, again, Henry's Turkey Service. That's right. And and we can say, oh, well, that happened with Henry's Turkey Service a really long time ago. People don't do that anymore. But it's not true because according to your research, it still happens yeah, with goodwill. Almost um, 200,000 disabled workers every year earn less than their non-disabled counterparts. Exactly. And according to your research here, Goodwill Industries, a $5.59 billion charity with huge contracts from the federal government and one of the largest employers of disabled workers in the nation. Their employees have reportedly earned as little as 15 cents an hour while, like you just said, while their CEO makes more than $712,000 in annual salary. Goodwill's rationale is this may be the only opportunity for the disabled to gain experience and shift to higher paying jobs. But the United States General Accountability Office, a nonpartisan government group, disagrees. According to a 2001 report, 5% of employees in sheltered workshops find work in minimum wage employment, just 5%. Yeah, just 5%. I was going to mention the sheltered workshops, yeah. Mm Because there are sheltered workshops where, for the most part at least, yeah, people with disabilities still earn sub-minimum wage because, again, only 5% earn the actual minimum wage, but that's it, just 5%. Right. And the rest legally can be exploited and earn less money yes. than, their, than their counterparts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you mentioned, um, tell us about Source America. I do remember that was another disability organization, again, exploited Section 14 of FLSA. Yeah. You say here, Source America, who hands out lucrative federal contracts to organizations like Goodwill, is fighting to keep the sub-minimum wage. Wage intact, yeah. Yep. So yeah, that is the sad part of this, is that like I'm sure with a lot of challenges and struggles we still deal with to this day, regarding the disability community and otherwise, there are organizations and people that you know, want to keep this very unfair, brutal roadblock that this disability community faces, you know, intact, because they don't want things to change for the better. They want things to stay unfair for the disability community because they don't really care. 
and they want to continue to become rich on the backs of the labors of those who are less fortunate than them. Yes. You said in one of your speeches, you said it's a government system built to fail the most vulnerable. And I, I do stand by that. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's such an important issue. It's you know, when you when you sit down and you look at it, it's shocking. If you're not aware that it's happening still to this day, it's shocking. And I think that's how I felt when I first became aware of the issue when I heard you advocating around it last year. I remember thinking, you know, there's all those stories from, say, the Industrial Revolution where, you know, children were working in factories and, and then even teenagers, you know, young women and, you know, in factories being disadvantaged and so on and so forth. And then, you know, even adult workers were, were so often being taken advantage of. But you think to yourself, you know, we've come so far as a nation and that type of thing doesn't happen to children anymore. That type of thing doesn't happen to workers. Like there are unions, there are labor laws, such as the Fair Labor Standard Act of 1938 that actually put laws into place that helps people, right? But there is a loophole and it directly disadvantages people with disabilities and allows them to legally be paid less money than the minimum wage. And throughout the decades since the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed in 1938, people with disabilities have continued to be disadvantaged by it and taken advantage of and exploited. So it's such important work that you're doing, bringing you know, light to this issue that is still a problem. Like we, we are still dealing with this today. So I just think it's such great work that you're doing, Alex. So good job. Thank you. So Alex, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what your goals are. So something that you said in one of your speeches, again, I'm going to keep quoting you back to you because I love so many of the things that you said. People say those with autism have a neurodivergent brain. I love that term, neurodivergent. Almost makes me sound like I have some kind of superpower, right? And and then something else that you said was people with disabilities are as varied as people of different races, religions, and cultures. And doesn't that make the world so much more interesting? And I just loved that. And so I wanted to talk to you about what you think your unique gifts are. And then I wanted to, you know, explore with you, you know, what your career goals are and talk about what your goals are in life and the things that you hope to accomplish. Sure. Uh, I feel like one of my unique gifts is, of course, my talent as a public speaker mm-hmm. and to speak uh, to different different audience members and age groups and generations and things along those lines on behalf and in support of disability community because of course I continue I want to continue my career goal as a public speaker advocate for people with disabilities. I know another thing that I want to do this is a passion I have in life as well is that as a individual that does consider himself to be a big fan of the entertainment business as well. I'm actually um, hoping I can become one day uh, a professional filmmaker, movie director, a person who makes and directs movies. And I think to make sure I also tie that in with my disability work, I, I am actually considering and would love to tell stories in like movie or motion picture form about some of the struggles and challenges the disability community have faced. Cause I think I'm actually considering on hopefully doing that and sort of bringing that to the limelight in like the motion picture movie world or something along those lines perhaps. Cause I do want to continue to advocate for disability community as I really do deeply care about that. I don't see why you couldn't marry the two together. I think that that sounds amazing. Alex, I did not know that about you. I did not know that that was your career goal was to go into the movies. I think that is amazing. I uh, actually right now just share this with you. I recently, since uh, December 23rd, I've gotten a job at a movie theater. I'm part of the cleanup crew. Um, Awesome. I am in charge of four things. Throwing away trash. I use these like white buckets to dump like liquid straws and ice cubes and then I bring them to the kitchen then I um dump them in the sink cleaning tables off and then sweeping the floors and hallways and stuff so I'm a big fan of the movie business and entertainment industry as a whole and yeah I hope to hopefully one day become a professional filmmaker and maybe tell you know, again some of these stories about the struggles of the disability community as well as other passion projects and things along those lines. What a perfect way to fund your education that will lead to hopefully making the very movies that other people will be seeing in the movie theater someday, right? Yeah, or at least I hope so, for sure. 
Yeah, I love it. That's awesome. As you know, and as I know, the desire to get involved in advocacy work almost always stems from personal experiences, personal pain, personal trials and hardships that we have in our own lives. And so I always like to say, you know, advocacy work is born in pain, but it is fueled by love. And sometimes we're successful, sometimes we are not. And it can get really discouraging sometimes when we are fighting, 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 fighting for change. And either it's really slow in coming or it doesn't seem to come at all. And I know that there are those who have fought for decades for certain changes to be made and then they never see those changes made but their work helps change systems for future people right Mm -hmm. um but those that never see the change you know those that live their whole lives advocating for issues and then pass away but their hard work took root and then future generations were able to take that hard work and build upon it and eventually make the change that those people were advocating for it can get discouraging to think that we may for certain issues that we may never see the fruits of our labors because we just don't know when we jump into advocacy work right so what helps you persevere when you get discouraged in your advocacy work? Well, I I think what helps me persevere and not give up is just having things like support of friends and family and knowing perhaps how far I've come over the course of my life and all the great previous accomplishments and stuff I've done to better the world in some way and uh, knowing how much of a difference I have made and am making in the life I live. And in other words, I feel like what allows me to keep going and persevere is just counting my blessings and counting my accomplishments in life. I love it. I love it. I think you're spot on counting our blessings and counting our accomplishments and then just never giving up, right? Mm -hmm. daring to hope that no matter what our efforts will make a positive difference in the world Mm -hmm. i love that okay so last but not least how do you think the general public can better support people with disabilities i think ways that the general public can just help support people with disabilities is just for starters encouraging you know the disability community to feel included and to feel loved and supported and respected by fellow individuals and Americans and maybe just voting or you know really doing whatever a specific person can to like encourage organizations and maybe encourage politicians or try to get decent politicians in our political government perhaps that will support and advocate for this build community as well and get maybe other higher up organizations to chip in as well and maybe to create some positive change in some form regarding that too and just overall just trying to sort of set up the dominoes of advocacy for the disability community to be supported in and to eventually slowly but surely thrive more and more as we get further in moving forward. I love it. I think you're absolutely right. There are a lot of marginalized communities in the world. The disability community is just one of them. Mm-hmm. But it's so important that we form allyship with other communities, right? And I don't think I appreciated that until I found myself in a marginalized community as the mother of a child with disabilities. You know, my perspective changed really fast. I couldn't see the privilege that I lived with, the fact that I didn't really have to think about certain things. And it really opened my eyes to what other marginalized communities go through. And I think as we form allyships with other communities, it's going to lift all of us, right? All of us are going to progress in regard to equality and opportunities and, you know, making sure that we're able to get rid of policies that harm, right? For example, Section 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, like that directly harms people with disabilities. And as we form these allyships with other communities, it's just really important that we focus on those policies that harm and get rid of them, as well as focus on policies that offer more equal rights and more opportunities and protections to those in marginalized communities. So Alex, I just think the work that you are doing is so phenomenal. And I, and I am so impressed with your courage and your strength. It takes a lot of guts to get up in front of big groups of people and to give speeches. 
And you've been doing that for years and you're not that old. And so I'm just really impressed that you have engaged in that work so confidently from such a young age. Thank you, Susanna. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Absolutely. So my very favorite thing that you said in the speeches that you sent me, I'm going to repeat back to you. And that was, my disability does not define me. It is a small part of a much bigger life. And I don't think I could sum up who you are, who my daughter is. So many people in the world that have disabilities, It that line sums it up, I think, for everyone. Disability is just one facet of a much bigger life, much bigger purpose, much more meaning in a person's life. It's just, you know, they're just facts. They're, it's just information about a person. And something I think unique about the disability community is unlike other marginalized communities, for example, you know, the Black community, I'm, I'm never going to be part of their community because I'm, I'm not going to suddenly be Black, right? Like that's just mm-hmm. not a thing that will ever happen. But of course, even though I don't have their experiences, I can form allyships with them and champion their cause and help the Black community in any way that I possibly can, right? But what's so unique about the disability community is that literally anyone can become part of the community just like that, right? And so, you know, it's important to include and offer equal rights to and help all marginalized communities. But I just think it's particularly, I would, I would think that society would be particularly interested in helping the disability community, considering that virtually everyone is part of it at some point, right? Uh, Most people, as they become elderly, become disabled to some degree, right? All of us should be championing the causes of all marginalized communities, but I think specifically people in the disability community. So I just think that you're such a hero and you probably don't even look at yourself that way, but I'm just really impressed with the work that you're doing. And I think you're absolutely right. Disability does not define anyone. It is a small part of a much bigger life. So Alex, I just want to thank you so much for coming on Warrior Stories and um, sharing your story with us. Was there anything else you wanted to share before we jump off the call? No, I'm good. I just want to say uh, very quickly, thank you so much for having me. This I appreciate the opportunity. It was great to reconnect with you, Susanna. I hope that you know I can stay connected in some form with you and the rest of my PIP members. I really do. So take care, happy holidays, have a happy new year. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was such an honor and privilege to do this interview with you. Absolutely. It was my privilege. And and same to you. It's been so great to reconnect Mm -hmm. and we'll keep in touch. Okay. Yeah. Take care, Susanna. Thank you. You too, Alex. We'll talk to you later. Bye.